The Audi RS6 journey started two decades ago with the launch of the C5 generation. This was one of the first ever fast family wagons that justified the idea of purchasing something ridiculously quick for family use. The W210 E55 AMG at the time was weedy with 90 horsepower less, and BMW's E34 M5 was getting long in the tooth with its successor, the E39, not being manufactured as an estate. With the Quattro system, the C5 RS6 could hit 60 in just over 4.5 seconds, on par with the 360 Modena, which was Ferrari's latest V8 offering at the time. More generations came and went with the famed V10 C6 generation, the most powerful production Audi at the time. In 2013, the C7 was born, the fastest RS6 yet, with a top speed of 189 miles per hour if you'd opted for the Dynamic Plus package. And then there's today, the C8, which has been out for a few years now, the largest, heaviest, and most expensive RS6 to date at £100,000 plus options, and the car that Audi have trusted me, a 25-year-old, with for a few weeks. Hello. So then, shall we start with a launch control? Okay. So to say this thing's fast is a hilarious understatement, a bit like saying Roman Abramovich is a little bit dodgy. I think it's a bit more than that. This Audi RS6 is the first car I ever had the privilege of driving for a good amount of time, where not only does it make the passengers feel like they're on stealth at Thorpe Park, they can feel their guts sinking back inside them, but it makes me, the driver, feel that as well. And that's unusual because I'm driving the car, I know when it's coming, I'm holding onto a wheel, but this car, when you launch it, it literally gives me that tummy sinking feeling. And I've never experienced that from the driver's seat of a car before. That launch was 3.4 seconds to 60, or 100 kilometers an hour, from a standing start, by the way. Ridiculously impressive for March roads in the UK. They're not bone dry, the tires are not massively warm. 3.4 to 62 ridiculous so i've had this audi rs6 from audi for about 10 days and i've used it in almost every single weather condition eventuality and situation and i have to say i absolutely i absolutely love it when walking up to the car before i even get inside it i get that childlike giddy feeling just by looking at well the tango red paintwork which is gorgeous and all of the carbon fiber on the car this is the carbon black edition so it comes with from splitter in carbon side skirts in carbon and the rear diffuser covering those huge huge twin exhaust tailpipes in carbon too you then step inside and you're greeted by this glass cockpit and this beautiful alcantara steering wheel which feels so, so lovely to hold. And then you get in the car and drive it and you have absolutely no idea what sort of an animal this car is until you stick it in RS mode and put your foot down because it is mightily good at disguising the fact that it's basically 600 brake horsepower from that twin turbo V8 under the bonnet. It's 600 horsepower, all wheel drive, and it's a flipping family wagon estate car that launches you to 60 in under three and a half seconds. But until you do do the RS mode, you wouldn't know because in efficiency mode, in automatic mode or comfort mode, the thing is, well, comfortable and very smooth. Also, very, very quiet. But then you just go like this and you're at 60 miles an hour and all of a sudden, this is an Audi RS6. This thing is standard and I know a lot of people who own these tune them because they are pretty easily tunable will beat pretty much anything on the road from a standing start. It has 285 tires on the rear, and of course is Quattro, so it just links up. Every time you put your foot down, wet, dry, snow, whatever it is, it seems to just be able to put that power down the entire time, which, well, I've never quite experienced anything just like that. It's remarkable. As you can see, the ride in this RS mode, which I have configured to the most bumpy of settings is very crashy. Now it's probably not helped by the fact we're on 22 inch 
alloy wheels, which are crazy, but it is extremely crashy indeed. But with the touch of the button as we're now entering the quiet village of Mentmore, we stick it into efficiency mode, flick the huge throttle quadrant gear selector into drive, and everything softens up, everything goes really, really quiet. And no one would know when I'm driving by them how much noise I've just been making and how many stones I've been flicking up. And I really wouldn't know either because it's just an Audi A6 diesel now. And I think essentially over the time with this car, I've concluded that that's basically what this car is. That's what the appeal is in its entirety. The fact that this very car can be two in one. Most of the time, realistically, it's this sort of Audi A6 estate. Could be a diesel, could be one of the smaller petrol engines. And it's just a very comfortable, practical car. But with the flick of a couple of buttons, it becomes this terrifying, 600 horsepower, fire breathing, German brute that just tears down the road. And we're gonna to have to flick it back into RS2, back into manual, down into second, down into first. Some nice backfires on the overrun. And we're just gonna plant it around this corner. And it just links up. This thing isn't just a one-trick pony in terms of its straight line performance because it does actually handle tremendously well given the thing is huge and also very very heavy for a new car at least with the electronic steering and whatnot this thing handles pretty nice you do feel a lot of feedback through the wheel probably largely helped by the size of the wheels and it's really nice feel actually no it's not like my porsche boxster which is hydraulic and you literally feel every bump in the road but I can feel what the car is doing underneath me, which is extremely reassuring. And that paired with the fact that you can just plant it anywhere. This car is incredibly confident inspiring. I think anyone could get in this car and immediately drive it fast. But when you're pushing on on a beautiful B road like this, and you want to throw it into a corner and throw some moves, make some shapes, it seems to stick to the road extremely well. It's got air suspension and in this dynamic mode, we obviously have it in the lowest of settings. And so the body roll is more or less non-existent. And the grip that these tires provide, and I guess that four wheel drive system is also rather remarkable. One major drawback of all of these incredible things though, that come as a package, is this car ain't half expensive to run. It is surprisingly awful on fuel economy. And actually, if you watch Sam from Seeing Through Glass and maybe more specifically listen to his behind the glass podcast which I am an avid listener of he has uh, recently bought an Audi RS6 and has spoken of this as well that he is very surprised at how awful this thing is unfueled and I had no ideas about it going into sort of this press drive or test that I had with this car for a couple of weeks because the sort of average I get with this car is around 16 miles per gallon which well how do I compare it I mean my big 4.4 litre Range Rover uh, that's about three tons, that is around 20 miles per gallon. This average is around 16. That is horrendous. And what's more is that on a run, you would expect that, well, that's okay, because you can get it up to 30 odd. Nope. I've struggled to see anything near or matching around mid twenties. Generally speaking, we're at around 22 miles per gallon. And that's been a real surprise. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not that fussed about fuel. Um, it's just what it is, but at this level, where you're putting 100 quid in to film this video, for example, because when you drive it like I am right now, we're talking more single digits. Um, it is, you know, a real consideration and it is way, way more expensive to run than you might think, given that this is somewhat marketed as a family car. But anyway, forget the fuel economy for a second because it's all about smiles per gallon, am I right? I have to say, for me, I'm not the biggest of Audi fans, but of course, I've been very lucky and been exposed, thanks to Audi UK, to some of their newest and greatest models over the last six months or so. And of course they are growing on me, but what I'm getting at is that because I've sort of taken more of an interest in Audis lately, I've sort of looked back at the previous generations of the RS6, and I have to say, I think this is the best looking one yet. No, it doesn't have some of the sort of smooth and classical lines 
that you got on some of the older generations. But as a sort of statement and as a just a piece of metal on the road, this thing certainly has the most presence of any RS6 that's come before it because the attention this car garners is way more than I was expecting, just like the fuel economy. Everyone seems to look at this car. Now, whether it's the paintwork or it's just the huge wide arches that I can see in my rear mirror, people seem to stare at it and people seem to love it. As with all Audis of the latest generation, we've got a lovely glass cockpit display and various configurability using the controls on the steering wheel here. I can have my maps, I can have my music, I can look at how awful my fuel economy is, which by the way, we're averaging around nine miles per gallon right now as we film this review. But there's a number of things that you can do on the screen in front of the driver which um, is good. You know, you can sort of do everything from this one screen. Although what you can't do from this one screen is adjust your seat controls and your ventilation, which brings me on to sort of the multimedia screens in the middle here. There's two, one lower one, which controls the ventilation and the seat controls, and the upper one, which you can access maps, Apple CarPlay, and some other sort of settings and features with the car, of which there's quite a numerous few. But annoyingly, yes, you have to sort of go down here and take your eyes off the road to change my temperature in the car from 22 to 22.5, which is a little bit annoying because I just don't find it all that safe. Also, it's haptic touch, so you really sort of have to apply a fair bit of pressure before the screen res responds, which I find quite annoying, and actually I've managed to turn that off, which has made the whole experience a little bit more user-friendly. Let's get past this cyclist. Ha <laughs> ha! Have a bit of V8 cyclist. Second gear, three, two, one. Four. And when you have it in the most aggressive setting as well, as you probably just saw there, the thing shifts like a bloody Lamborghini Aventador and kicks you right in the neck. This thing is a brute. Realistically then, if you have one of these RS6, you'll be wanting to take them on a long journey. And it is a very good car for that. It has cruise control and all the sort of things you would expect on a newer car, and it is stupendously quiet, more so than you'd expect. I mean, you would have thought with these huge tires, you're gonna pick up a ton of road noise, but you really don't. So I guess that's testament to the noise cancellation and insulation on the car. It's a lovely place to sit for a long amount of time. And I can see why people call these cars, you know, the sort of dream, daily car because I mean it is fantastic fun to have something and I reiterate there is two cars in one you know I'm sitting here on cruise control at 50 miles an hour now in eighth gear dead silent dead comfortable and the car's really easy to drive superbly good visibility out the back in particular but also out the sides but then you do look out the side see those huge arches and literally by pressing these two buttons I can just transform it into this monster and so it's a great long distance car if you can get over that terrible fuel economy best thing to do in my opinion is just to go all in and go for the single figures the entire time because that's what puts a smile on your face until you get to the pump of course It is scary. It is scary how quickly this car gets to the speed limit. It really, really is. So before I lose my license, let's pull over now, calm down a little bit, take a chill pill, and I'll show you a few more features in the car because I think it is worth a mention. It is a lovely kitted out thing and it's a beautiful car to look at. I mean, I do think it just looks stunning. And the drive is really fun. Don't get me wrong, there, are more fun things to drive out there. I mean, God, for 115 grand, which is what this car is list at with its options. I mean, you could buy a McLaren 570S. See, lots of people will have a problem with the fact that I've said that because they break down all the time, but that is a, you know, a drilled in supercar. So you could get one of those. You could probably, I mean, maybe a few years ago, almost get yourself a Ferrari 488, very used, of course. 
Uh, Lamborghini Huracan, for example, that would come into this category. There's a lot of driver's cars out there that you can buy for this money, and so this isn't it. This isn't the best of those options, of course, but none of them have four seats and none of them have a huge boot, as I'm about to show you. So really, as a sort of daily proposition, which this car is, is there anything that you can sort of take your kids to school in and go to the tip with straight after that will put a massive smile on your face? M5 competition maybe, but that's not an event. That's not an estate car. You couldn't get as much in it. Porsche Panamera, perhaps, but I don't know. This thing is a very, very compelling, compelling choice, I have to say. Anyway, let's pull over because um, this thing is really a license loser. I mean, it really is. So uh, we'll pull over and I'm gonna show you a few of the other bits around the car and then I'll summarize. But, uh, woo! This car definitely makes you put a sweat on. So with this being an estate car and a van like Audi might say, or like I like to say, a wagon, uh, it would be a shame not to show off the boot. And the boot is monumentally large, as you would expect. It is really, really impressive. But to me, there's only one real way that we can demonstrate that. And that would be to, well, sleep in it. Because let's be honest, if you are the sort of person that has 115,000 pounds to spend on a car like this, well, once you've spent that money, you're certainly not gonna be able to afford anywhere to live. So you're gonna have to sleep in the car. So this is probably quite a useful test. So I think we pull that little button there. There goes the seats on that side and the other seat on that side. And if I just crawl on in, watch my electronic parcel shelf. And there's even a nice bar here. They thought of that to pull yourself under. And actually, They've even thought about the pillow situation because these seats aren't completely flat and they're ever so slightly raised. If I had more time, I would take this on a trip and go and sleep in it because there's so much room in here and uh, I have room to spare. I could even get someone next to me and I think there's plenty of room for activities, if you know what I mean. But very, very impressive boot size nonetheless. I'm, uh, well, very short actually, I'm under six foot, but still, how impressive is that? In the back of the RS6 then, we also have these lovely, lovely seats. They're very, very comfortable. And probably the only thing that you can really do in the back of here is play with the climate controls, which are very nicely uh, illuminated on this screen here. All touchscreen, as is the sort of multimedia at the front. Very, very nice. Sadly though, it doesn't seem to have any heated or cooled seats in the back, which is an utter shame because in the front, at least, they're very, very nice. Leg room, extremely impressive too. This is probably a good seven or eight inches from my knees, and this is in my driving position. But yeah, lovely little place. I've got my panoramic sunroof. It doesn't open, but there's an electronic blind that comes across. Although again, you can only control that from the front, which is a little bit of a shame. It does have cup holders. You might be wondering where they are. Well, they're hidden away in this little cubby here. What else is in there? Nothing. Yeah, no adjustability on the seats either, which is, bit of a shame but yeah to be honest a very very nice place to be and if I was a child being driven around in this and my dad had it I would be beside myself in the front of the RS6 then and the place I've been spending all of my time much of the same really in terms of quality absolutely fantastic seats I believe these are optional extras if I look at the spec sheet there's some special RS edition seats but yeah extremely supportive and lovely no complaints there at all this Alcantara steering wheel as I mentioned in my last video, is the party piece for me. It's absolutely gorgeous to hold and far, far nicer and user-friendly than the BMW equivalent on their M cars with the huge, chunky wheel. You literally need to be the BFG to get a good grasp on that. But this is very lovely and everything is very configurable. Everything is controlled through these two touchscreens here, even your air controls on this lower screen, which I'll say is probably not my favorite thing. And all sorts of stuff on here, Apple CarPlay, which connects as soon as you get into the car. It has its own navigation. It has lots of different configurability settings, such as what the lights do when you unlock it, uh, the lights in the car, and you can control your seat heating and ventilation here or in here on the lower screen. Now, my only complaint with this is, and I'm a bit of a broken record because I've said this before, it's a little bit distracting having all of the controls on two sort of touch screens here. It's quite distracting. Now, one thing I've done that's really helped is I've turned the haptic touch off 
The haptic touch is that sort of feedback you get, like a sort of clicking sensation when you press down. And I found with that on, you're always trying to sort of press really hard and you often don't feel the click, so you have to press again and it gets quite distracting. But I've turned that off, and now it is more just like an iPhone where you just have to touch and it works without having to give much pressure. I say that, but it's not actually. Oh, there we go. Yeah, no pressure required. It will just do it. And you don't really have to pay as much attention to it, which I find much better. Same with down here, as with most new cars and Audis at least, you have the 360 and 3D cameras. Don't really ever use it. You tend to just use the normal one that you'd get in most cars, just sort of the reversing camera with the lines. The same with the front. Very helpful to have. But this 3D thing, I haven't quite found uh, an appropriate or useful need for it, other than just sort of showing it off to my friends and family going, oh, look at this, that's my car. Look, and you can see what's behind us. Wow, there's absolutely nothing there because we're sat in the middle of a farmer's field. I do love the throttle quadrant style gear selector here. It's almost like what you'd find in an Airbus A320. Feels very cool. Alcantara over the top, lovely, lovely to hold. Uh, electronic parking brake, automatic brake, which is very useful, and two, okay, cup holders. To be honest, it looks really nice if you don't use the cup holders and just do that, but then you're driving along like this. So, yeah, not really ideal. Lastly, in here, we've got a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of storage. You can't really get more than a credit card in there, but also a wireless charging um, area, which is, you know, handy, but I actually never really use it. I just have the USB, plug my phone into that. But if you have a passenger, it's quite a handy thing. And a glove box, which is a glove box. So that's the front of the Audi. So to summarize my experience living with this Audi RS6 then, which I must just preface and say, I'm extremely fortunate and very, very thankful that I get the opportunity to do so. Um, I would say I absolutely love the car. I'm gonna be very, very sad to see it go. It does almost about absolutely everything. One thing I didn't quite expect from this car, and it probably has something to do with the fact that this is in a very striking Tango Red, is the amount of attention you get on the road from other drivers. I guess the RS6 is a little bit of a, I don't know, everyone seems to know what a Range Rover is. I feel like the RS6 has a little bit of a similar thing going on. And this isn't ever so subtle with the huge black grille RS6 badging on the front and on the rear. Everyone does know what it is, and therefore you do get a lot of looks driving this car, you don't really fly under the radar as much as you might expect. So something to bear in mind if you're not like me and don't crave all the attention in the world. Would I go ahead and buy an Audi RS6? Well, no, because I can't afford one. But in all honesty, I would certainly never pay for one of these new because I don't need to tell you that depreciation is a thing that very much exists, especially with these sorts of cars that are quite high production. You can probably pick up one of these that's about a year old now for way under 100 grand, more like 90, in fact. And so if I was going to buy an RS6 or I desperately wanted one, I would certainly wait for them to be a few years old and then I'd make my move. One thing I'd never get bored of though is the effortless power that this car has in absolutely every single rev range, it has grunt. And when you do those launch controls, I mean, even now after having about two weeks with the car. I've done a handful of them, let's say, and they put a smile on my face every single time. From a quality perspective, I have really no complaints other than in the back, sort of the back of the seats are a little bit plasticky and nasty. But from where I'm sitting and where you'll be sitting if you're thinking of buying one of these, um, it's absolutely, absolutely faultless to be honest. And lovely, lovely place to be, a lovely place to spend your time. And again, just makes you smile from ear to ear when you put your foot down. Things I would say that are a little bit disappointing though, to summarize, is the fuel economy. Um, way worse than I expected. Normally, I sort of think, you know, these big twin turbo high powered V8s, yeah, they're gonna get really almost single figures, if not, you know, worse, if you're driving them around town or driving them like an absolute lunatic, as I have been in this video. However, you can always seem to get good numbers, high 20s, even 30s, if you take them on the run. However, it's been different with this. I've really, really tried on several runs to get high figure MPGs. And well, I've struggled to get anywhere really above the mid twenties, 25 point something I think is the best I ever saw. But realistically, when you're trying to drive in the M25 and people are constantly changing their speed, 21, 22 MPG is what you're gonna get out of these on a big cruise, which, well, with the fuel prices these days is quite a consideration to be honest, considering it's about 180 a litre for super juice at the moment, which is crazy. If you're in the US, that's something like eight or $9 a gallon. So, that's the only thing I would really complain about with this is the fuel economy. Besides that, then this car is, you know, completely faultless, as you would expect. 
it's a lovely, lovely thing. There's way better driver's cars out there. There's more comfortable cars out there, but this sort of does them all very, very well. And the shame of the matter really is that they're just so unobtainable for the vast majority of us, especially me at 115,000 pounds. There's 101 other things that I would buy first, but it comes down to taste. And like I say, if you're looking for an all-rounder and something you can scare your children in, look no further. The Audi RS6 is most probably the best car for you. Thanks all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video with a newer car. Not something we do ever so much on this channel when I'm normally buying old sh boxes for lack of a better term, but nonetheless, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you've subscribed if you're not already, and I'll see you all very, very soon.